Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, my name is Darren and I'm going to talk to you today about a brief uh, story of astronomy. I'm going to say brief because there's so much detail we can talk about. I just want to talk about some of the key players and some key events that have happened in astronomy that helps us understand where we are today. So that's me on the picture and that is my wife. Um, I just wanted to tell you that was our first date. We went to this uh, telescope, radio telescope in Macclesfield, and this was one of the radio telescopes that actually tracked the moon landing. So we, um, my wife knows the interest that I have in astronomy, and um, yes, it's, it's an amazing place if you ever want to go and visit. Okay. So we want to talk about some key players, and here I'm just going to give you a list of them, and just take a moment to think of the ones you may have heard of in in time so we've got Hypercus, we've got Ptolemy, Copernicus, Tycho Brahe, Kepler, Galileo, Newton, uh, Halley, Herschel and his sister Caroline Herschel, Einstein and Hubble. So you may have come across some of these when you've studied science and um, I think it's really sad that they're not necessarily household names and yet they've done great things in astronomy. So why should we study astronomy? Why should we learn about astronomy? Well, first of all, there are lots of things that come from learning about astronomy. For example, the space program. We get lots of by we get a byproduct like biomedical equipment. Even the humble CD player was a product of, of, of the space program. And lots and lots of things that we get from just going into space because of the technology involved. So when you look at all these people, how many people do you recognize? I will be talking about most of these in a little bit of detail. Um, you can see there's a sort of time, lane, time scale there that puts them in order. I'm not going to be talking about Einstein. I think there's been a lot said about Albert Einstein, but he's certainly a key player. But we want to talk about some people who you may not have heard of, like Tycho Brahe, um, um, Kepler, Copernicus, Ptolemy, maybe not. I'm not too sure who's online at the moment. Okay, so that's what we want to discuss in some detail. So when I say details, you can look at this sort of time scale of the Greek astronomers here, and Hipparchus, Erostosthenes, Archimedes, Aristarchus, Euclid. You may have heard of Euclid if you studied mathematics, the 13 books of Euclid, which I certainly studied at university. Eudoxus, we're gonna be talking about Eudoxus there although there's very little known about him, apart from what the um, people said about him afterwards. So we're going to be talking about a lot of these Pythagoras we might know in more details, um, but these are people that are kind of lost in history, some of them. Erostosthenes or Erastosthenes. I've heard different pronunciations. What did he actually do? You might have studied Archimedes in physics when we're talking about buoyancy. You'll come across that when you study at um, Abbey College, Cambridge. Euclid, as I said, you'll be studying about Euclid if you do mathematics, um, Aristotle, and definitely Pythagoras. So we can see we don't have time today to talk about all of these people, but we can just mention them um, here in passing. Here's a timeline, which, by the way, all these slides you can get from the internet. I've tried to reference all of them. This is just from an in internet, just a very brief picture of some of the things you'll see in history. We've got Isaac Newton there, we've got Galileo, eh, and, and so on. Many of the people that we're going to be speaking about today, and some of the technologies that have developed since. Again, we look in the 90s. Now, um, in the 90s, I appreciate you were not around in the 90s, possibly, majority of you, I would say. But this here, we see the developments there. Supermassive black holes verified, star birth image. We've got so many things happening in your lifetime that, that contemporary with you and myself. And then when you get to 1990, sadly, I was still around then. Things were happening. Um, we're not going to talk about all this, but to show you that, uh, astronomy is always developing. It never stands still. It's always advancing. We can talk, uh, see about the, the trips to Mars and what we're learning there with all the probes and stuff. So what I want to talk about is that briefly the different time periods. We've got the prehistoric, the motion of the sun, 
the moon and the stars, <clears throat> how they benefited mankind. Well, how they benefited in the past and how they benefit now. The classical ast astronomers, when they're using uh, trigonometry and mathematics to try and explain things like the retrograde motion of Mars and the distance ladders, which we're gonna mention in a few moments. The Renaissance, the boom of observational astronomy, when you could actually get a telescope out and look, because remember, the early astronomers didn't have that advantage. They, they were a thousand years before the telescope was invented. And then we talk about modern um, um, astronomers, physical laws that describe the heavens when people like Isaac Newton came along. Okay, then we want to talk about something called distance ladders. Now, this is part of the astronomical history. Why? Because we need to know how things are and how did we work this out? So you can see from this diagram, we're going to be looking at something called the parallax. And then what are the, what's this word here, the CFEDs and the, the galactic standard candles. Um, these are all um, tools to actually help us calculate distances with a, quite a lot of certainty, really. So I will be talking about that in some detail. Some of the people who actually helped us understand distance ladders. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about multi-wavelength universe, which is our modern um, um, understanding of astronomy, how we're looking at certain objects, no longer with just our eyes, but with different wavelengths, like the, um, the X-ray telescopes or the radio telescopes. So for example, some people of, uh, of an antiquity thought that the, the universe was so big, but then when they started to use telescopes, we realized we were just looking at gas and some of these telescopes penetrated the gas, for example, the hydrogen gas, radio telescopes penetrated the hydrogen gas and they could see so much more. So we're gonna be looking a little bit about multi-wavelengths. I want to conclude with a little um, sort of story really that um, a guy called Carl Sagan uh, spoke about. It's a very touching tribute to astronomy. He's, he's passed away many years ago, Carl Sagan. Um, I'll just talk about it briefly now, but uh, when Voyager 1 was finishing it, its task, um, it was commanded to turn around again and look one more time at the Earth. And there it is, the Earth in a sunbeam. But Carl Sagan talks about some really good lessons for you and me to understand. And I, that's how I want to finish my little talk today. <clears throat> So again, all these slides are available on the internet, so you can get them, but I just kind of compact them together with my experience to try and explain one or two things. So how did we get to where we are today? Well, it's interesting, we stand on the shoulders of giants, the people in all around the world, and this is what's beautiful about astronomy, it brings all cultures. No country or no individual has dominated because it's gone on for so long. We've got the Greeks, the Egyptians, Asian, European, Islamic, Indian scientists, all contributed to our knowledge today of astronomy. How do we explain things? Well, one person said this and the next person come along and continued that knowledge and built on that knowledge. People have died when they said something different, when they believed one thing and it was contrary to what some religious groups thought. So it can be life and death, our understanding of the planets. <clears throat> so how did they know what they knew? How did the um, astronomers, ancient astronomers, knew what they, they came, came up with? Well, that's what we're going to understand. So the basis of prehistoric, prehistoric astronomy, we have this celestial sphere, we're gonna abbreviate to CS, the rising and the setting of the sun, moon and stars the constellations, the annual motion of the sun, the motion of the planets through the zodiac and the phase of the moon and the eclipses. The eclipses, believe it or not, have told us so, so much. Not just about what we're gonna talk about today, because we've got a solar eclipse, it's helped us to understand the sun in great detail so that we as a planet can be prepared just in case we have uh, solar winds and high activity of the sun. So even eclipse can help us preserve life and our telescopes and our um, 
you know, our, our way of life here on the planet Earth. And of course, our satellites. So again, we're looking at rich cult, uh, cultural effects from the Indians and Chinese cultures that have embedded into astronomy that helped us understand where we are today. So just a few words I want to explain. So we get the context of what we're talking about. We've got the word geo, which means earth, and helio, which means sun. Centric means centered. So we're going to be talking about understanding of what we mean by a geocentric uh, model or a helocentric, heliocentric model. Now you might not think that makes much difference or it might be common sense that the sun is in the center of our solar system. Well, that wasn't always the case. And people fought hard to back and support the geocentric um, the model. So most, most ancient Greek astronomers believed that the Earth was the center of the solar system and the universe with everything orbiting in it, which is called the geocentric model. So we were the center of the universe. Carl Sagan really puts it nicely when he talks about what we are, a little pixel, he calls it, a little pixel. We're nowhere near the center of the universe, but that's what some people believed for many, many years. So ancient Greek astronomy, most ancient Greeks believed that astronomical objects were perfect, unchanging spheres and orbited in perfect circles around the Earth, because it had to be a circle because that was perfect, following different physical laws from those on Earth. And again, this was disputed by Copern Copernicus, Kepler and Galileo 1000 years later. So although they had many wrong ideas about the old solar system, the ancient Greeks made many important astronomical discoveries. And you can see this picture here is got the Earth in the center. And you can look in the pages of history and you'll see lots of references to the um, geocentric model. So we're going, we're going to talk about our characters and we've got Nicholas Copernicus here, 1473 to 1543 and a, the publication of his book on revolutions of the celestial spheres just before his death in 1543. But interesting model here. So we have the yellow sun, the blue earth, and the red um, Mars. Look what's happening here, in particular Mars, because you'll understand why this is happening, because what's that loop about? Well, later on, we're going to talk about the retrograde motion of Mars. So at some point in the, on the, in the, um, the calendar year, you see this planet going backwards. And how did they explain that? It looks, for those who have colored, um, um, studied polar coordinates in mathematics, which I have there, it looks more, more like one of the formula, like more or less like the cardioid um, that you study in polar coordinates. For those who have studied mathematics at that level will know what I'm talking about. So there's the models. Um, was it true? Was, was this true? We're, are we orbiting the sun in circular motion? Or have we got this, has Mars got this strange shape to it? So Tycho, Ty, Tycho Brahe was a very, very interesting character to study in, in astronomy. He, when he was two, he was kidnapped by his uncle. Um, and then he was taken away. But his parents didn't seem to mind, according to the story. And, but they wanted him to study law. But what, as uh, Tycho Brahe stood, um, actually grew up, he found a big interest in astronomy. And he started to look at how the planets move, etc. And he was really intrigued by this. And he soon discovered that the books that he was reading and his observations, his observations were more detailed than the books he was reading. And it's a very interesting story. He was a contemporary uh, of Copernicus. And that basically they had some fight at some point and his nose apparently was chopped off. And there was all kind of um, stories relating to this, how he put a gold one on and stuff like that. But who knows? Hey? But please read his, um, his account because it's very interesting. What he tried to do at first was to try and combine 
the, the two systems together. And it says combine the geocentric and the heliocentric models. And of course that didn't explain lots of things, but it was uh, an attempt at progressing our understanding of the universe. Johannes Kepler, excellent. Again, for those who have studied mathematics, you will study the ellipse in great details and you study these things um, called vectors. And you can see the velocity uh, and the acceleration going to the center and you've got the resultant force going in. But Kepler said, actually, we're not going around in circles. We're going around in these ellipses, which is um, how, how we understand it to this day. Galileo, when I first looked at a telescope and looked at Jupiter and I saw the first four moons of Jupiter, the, the main ones, well, he was the one that discovered them. Um, and he wrote this book, Two Chief World Systems, and argued for the heliocentric model. I'll come to that later on, but the, the book, he kind of put two arguments forward and he really was told not to take one side, but he actually did in the end. Um, how many moons has Jupiter got? Well, I, I, to be honest, I don't know. The last count was 63 because things are going around Jupiter, they're not sure always. I think I'm at 63, but there are four main moons of Jupiter. Now, I want to talk a little bit about um, distance ladders, how we understand distance ladders. Now, I won't have time to go into the details, but the slides you can have a look. Um, what do we mean by distance ladder? In other words, how can we calculate the distance to the next one? So first of all, how can we work out the distance of the Earth, the Earth to the Moon, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? So, 240 BC. Now, Erostosthenes, he was in Cyrene, and what he then did, he was sat at the uh, a well, and because it was the solstice, the summer solstice, he knew that the sun's rays come down in this well perpendicular. So he sat at a well, and all of a sudden, this ray of sun comes down, and he can see the sunlight is directly above. Most of us possibly would have just walked by. But he said, no, that's interesting. And he then discovered, I've heard different stories about this, he paid a friend to come and do this, or he walked all the distance. He then um, realized that in Alexandria, the, there was a seven and a half degree shadow. So this was very interesting because he thought, well, oh, we, the circumference of the earth, we can, we can calculate this out. Now, without going into the too much details, you can see if you, if you apply corresponding angles, basic level you can see that these two angles here correspond they're equal bit of basic mathematics geometry and then he knew the distance so he knew and he can he can equate these two things together and say okay well if seven and a half degrees represents eight kilometers we can actually work out the the circumference of the earth and he did and he got um, 38,400 miles, uh, sorry, 24,000 miles. And we're going to talk later on how close that really was. And it was a very, very good result for his So now they know the circumference of the Earth, more or less. So Aristarchus. So here he is. What he wanted to do, there he is. I'm not too sure if that was him. <laughs> to be honest, we have these statues and I'm never sure quite well if this is the right person. Who knows? There's no photography around in those days, which, I, which I, I, then I'm not sure how they've got this. But there you go. There's his work, Greek astronomer. And very clever what he did. He looked at the sun and he looked at the earth. And he knew that at some point the earth would block the moon and he could work out how long this took. So if you can see the next diagram there, the moon at the onset of the eclipse, the moon at the conclusion of the eclipse. So he then thought, hmm, that's interesting. 
and he decided that he could then work with for the mathematicians amongst you similar triangles he could start to use similar triangles and there's his lettering and he can start to put these triangles together to see if he can ascertain or work out the distance the size of the moon and also um the distance from the from the earth this is going to be on your slides we don't need to go into details but it's simple maths really it's just ratios and um it's not calculus or anything simple um ratios and similar triangles and there we are there's his his reasoning and then he concludes with the fact that the the radius of the earth is 3.7 times the radius of the moon so he propagated a test or test um territorial measurement for the radius of the earth which can be gotten easily from the circumference to a celestial measurement terrestrial sorry excuse me so it was very clever and he did that and Hipparchus did something similar uh, with similar triangles and eclipses to work out the distance uh, from the earth to the moon so what does that help them to do as i said this is a distance ladder so now they know how far away the moon is well that can help them work out this distance here the earth to the sun how well, we know that if you've got the moon on half moon, you can calculate this angle because then this makes this perpendicular. And then what you can do, you can do a bit of trigonometry as long as you can measure this angle. Now, they didn't do it perfectly, uh, but they did have a go. And you can see the cosine if you used trigonometry, the distance from the Earth to the moon, cosine theta or cosine A in this case, you can actually calculate this distance here if you if you've done any trigonometry the greeks were not very good at as the angle is what to measure it's true it's been angle a should be about that it's 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 a lot more precise i think than that now so the distance obtained should be about 150 million kilometers and then they can work out the diameter of the the, the sun as well we can we can work these things out using basic trigonometry so again, if you want to look at that, test the values out or go on. So the distance from the Earth to the Sun is called an astronomical unit, AU. So here's the latest value I've got. 149,597,000. Oh, no, so that's not. That's, that's billion, sorry. Or oh, 92,955,807 miles roughly the average earth sun distance so that's a very important unit so when you see your textbooks you'll see the au astronomical unit and it's it's so so important for measuring things and getting things right for sending people into space on missions probing pro sending probes into space this unit was very important in understanding we also used the tran um um the transit of venus so when venus would go across the and the sun we can use these calculations um, and as well as asteroids were also important kepler's law we're going to come to well we just mentioned them provide precise ratio of the size of the orbits of subjects resolving around the sun but not a real measure of the orbits themselves so they've used them more sophisticated ways to to calculate this but we're pretty much there with the astronomical unit this diagram i'm just mention it now because we have to kind of explain the stars now the stars are at so so many distances apart they're not in one sphere but they try to explain them for some kind of coordinate system as though we've got this big sphere around the earth with all these stars and the, the equidistance that helps with the that helps with them um, coordinates etc it's not actually true because the there are so many distances away from us. A line drawn. Remember, the Earth is not a perfect sphere. I mean, this globe is not a perfect sphere. Neither is the the, um, the planet Earth because we have this little bulge in the center. Okay. What I want you to do now, if you're listening, I want you to get your thumb out and look at an object with your left eye, and then look at it with a right eye left right what happens 
what happens? Well, if you just look at an object, you will see you've got a distance between the two eyes and things are shifting over. The angle is shifting. If you do that now, it's quite interesting. You've basically experienced called the parallax effect. And this is the most fundamental distance measurement from the trigonometry parallax. As the Earth orbits the sun, you can see this as it goes round to the summer, this one AU. And you see the stars, you get this parallax effect. So what we do, we can actually use this effect to help us find the distance to stars. These shifts are angles in a right angle triangle. You can see this. Uh, this is 2AU making the short leg of the triangle and the distance to the stop being the long length, this one here. The amount of shift is quite small, measuring one arc second for an object, a distance of one parsec. Now this here will be one parsec there and it's approximately 3.26 light years. So astronomers, you hear the words light years and parsecs used in astronomy as a, as a um, guide to distances. Therefore, decreasing in angular amount as the reciprocal of the distance. So this is what we want to measure. So as I said to you there, we, we express things in parsecs, light years are used in popular media, but most invariable values in light years have been converted from numbers tabulated in parsecs in the original source. So please do, you can find these calculators online if you want to use them, but you'll, you'll come across these in lots of astronomy books. And that's really reiterating what I've just said there. So this is how it works really. And you will come across this, just go back one. You've got this earth and sun, and you've got these distant stars. Well, these are not really moving, are they? So in December, you're, you're there. And in June, you're over there. So you've got this line will continue through. So what you've got from this, you've got an angle, the parallax angle. Hopefully you can see that. So this is one IU and you can actually, just go back there, sorry. This is one AU and you can now work these things out. Um, and you can work out the distance using the parallax effect. Very powerful. There is a limitation on this. As I showed my first slide on distance ladders, it only takes you to a certain point. For some really distant stars that are many, many light years away, we move on to a different method, which we'll come into in a few moments. There is an example of this. Okay. Uh, Bessel, Frederick Bessel, in 1831, this little star that you may or may not have heard of, 61 Cygna. Well, basically, this one was the first one that was measured. The distance of this star was measured using the parallax. And um, he got 10.4, which was very close because it was 11.4 light years, which is a huge distance away, really. Um, and it was the very first one to, to be measured as a um, stellar parallax. Now, I thought I'd throw this little slide in because the star is about 720,000 astronomical units from the Earth. This is 100 trillion kilometers away. Now, you can see this animation here now. What's, what's the two star? What are the two lights? Well, actually, it's because this star is in a binary system. And in astronomy, many, many stars come in twos and they circle one another. So the Earth is more unusual because it's on its own. But many, many stars um, come in, in, in a binary pair. This is um, common in the universe. I did actually know the distance between these two, but I can't remember. But we do know um, the star is about 720,000 astronomical units away. Okay. Standard candle in an astro astronomical object that is known when you know its absolute magnitude. So what happens when we get distances further? So we need some kind of standard candle. We need some kind of reference point that we can say, if this is a certain brightness and we're dimmer or brighter, we can say, well, it's nearer or further away. And this is the method that we use. This is a formula for those who do maths. 
where the m, the small m, is the apparent ma magnitude and m is the absolute magnitude, which we can ascertain or work out through spectroscopy. And d is the distance in uh, parsecs. So if you are seeing different formulas or different versions of this, it might be because you are in a different unit. So we can actually rearrange this if we know these two values to get the d value, okay? I'm not deriving this formula, but how clever was the person who did that? That's really incredible. But let's talk about a little bit how this came to be, how we came to get this formula. There we go with the uh, standard candle, the astronomical unit. So if light travels at 300, thousand kilometers per second how far does it travel in one year so this is our light years hmm. how far does it travel in one year well there's your answer huge numbers coming out here so we don't need to be writing all these zeros that it hence explains why we use things like standard form in maths we use parsecs when we use light years because we could have 20, 30 zeros in some places. Okay, so standard candle, we're going to talk about Seaford variables. There are some of the ones called the Lyra stars, are our Lyra stars. And we also can have supernovas as standard candles, but I'm not going to be talking about supernovas, although I find them absolutely fascinating. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the Lyra uh, stars either. I just want to talk a little bit about CFID variables because what they do, they pulse and their, and their brightness, their luminosity changes. But something interesting happens. In 1868, this lady, um, sorry, she was born in 1868 to 1921. Henrietta Leavitt was an astronomer who opened the door to a dramatic enlargement in the size of the known universe. Now, I can guarantee you most people would have never even heard of this person. And there she was making these profound uh, changes to what we found and what we've discovered. She found that a certain type of star, the CFID variable, and there are two types, pulses at a rate that's related to its brightness. A CFID variable star pulse rate reveals the star's true fundamental brightness. What's that got to do with anything? Well, let's find out, because this is really, really clever what she's done. So here's one particular one, a CFID variable. And what they did is they measured the luminosity against the time period. Because once you get the time period, it helps you to work out the distance. So what was happening is the luminosity was dropping and as it pulsated and it would rise again, but it would be quite regular and constant. Here we go. Here's a, a typical graph with the luminosity um, on the y-axis and the time, uh, the period in days on the x-axis, um, or the uh, dependent variable and the independent variable being the period of time. So you've got this straight graph, which is a correlation of a linear function that's basically saying, okay, we've got this graph and we've got this. Well, maybe because it, it's relatively linear, it's got a strong correlation there, um, we can use this to ascertain distances, to work out distances. And we've got the RR Lyra there. Yeah, there is still a correlation, uh, and we can still use that. Okay. There's much more detail in this, by the way, but this is the basic outline. So a standard can candle is an astronomical object that's known to absolute magnitude. They're extremely important to astronomers since by measuring the apparent magnitude of the object, we can determine, determine sorry, its distance of the object. If we can determine its distance using the formula, where M is the apparent magnitude of the object, M is the absolute magnitude of the object, and D is the distance in parsecs, which we said earlier. So for example, we've got this, um, and they're going up, seems a bit odd, they're going up negative values, but um, something that is minus 3.6 and something that's minus 5.0, the minus 5.0 is actually the brighter one. 
So the magnitude there, the log of 4.78 is 0 0.68. When this is plotting in a value of about minus 3.6, results with its ab absolute magnitude. So what she did was quite incredible. And I just put one example in there. So uh, the, the one that we use, this one here, if I can just go back. If I could use this value, and you can go back and, and find the distance in parsecs. So that was quite a quick tour, but please do have a look at the slides and investigate. These slides are all online, and I, I brought together lots of resources that I've tried to reference at the end, so you should be able to see this one. Okay, this means that the CFID in the LMC uh, large magnetic cloud is about 68.2 kilopascals, about 222,000 light years away. Okay, so more importantly, if we infer that the size of the LMC relative to its distance from us is small, we've also found the distance in the LMC within which the CFID is located. So there's so much information. I've gone pretty quick there, um, but that's how you, how you would actually put that out. So the standard candle approach, if you know you have the same source of light, then counting the number of photons through a standard area detector um, tells you the distance to the source. The light from a point source drops off according to the inverse square law, a strictly geometrical relationship. So we can use that in conjunction with what we've just said to actually work out the distances. And once you've worked this out, you can then go on to work other things out um, there are the other methods, of course, um, to actually find the objects that are so far away um, that this wouldn't work. But for some many, many um, objects, it, this will be suffice, this will work. So prehistoric astronomy, this is before 500 BCE. Uh, the cyclic motion of the sun, the moon and the stars, they used it for timekeeping, uh, for telling the future, the diet, the direction determination. And there's a fantastic book called The Longitude Problem, um, when we have to sort of look at the stars to try and navigate our way on the seas. This was a lot later, of course. Fantastic book and um, how it can be problematic trying to you know, use the stars for distances, especially when we're traveling in the sea. Ptolemy, 150 AD. Like Aristotle, I believe that the Earth is the center of the universe. The sun and five planets uh, orbitals, boom. So this was quite common for us to have this geocentric idea. Here's a model of what it looked like. And this didn't explain a lot of things, problems. There is a video here. I'm not going to watch this video, but it's there for you to, um, to have a look at your leisure. Uh, there is one I might play shortly. This is about Egyptian astronomy. Uh, which is very, very interesting. We just don't have time to do today. So here's what's happening with the, the stars scattered at all different distances in this, this model here, but we can model it as in it was one big sphere and they are all at different distances. I mean, equidistances. It's not, of, true, of course, true. And then the, 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 um, what they tried to do was explain the constellations with these diagrams and zodiac diagrams. I think this might be the supernova that I'm, I'm talking about soon of Eudoxus. Uh, I can't remember if this, this where I'm putting my um, mouse there is, is the actual location. I think it is, I'll double check that. The motions of the planets. Um, Ancients observed bright stars that seem to move through faster than others. Stars, inverted commas. Of course, he was talking about planets observed to move through the same narrow band of the sky, the zodiac, because planets lie in roughly the same orbital plane, but ancients did not know this. Now, this was a real head scratcher, literally. You see this here, this red line. What was actually happening here is some of these moving stars, as they called them, was kind of doing a loop. What was going on? They, they, it was puzzling people, especially if you were supporting the geocentric model. What's going on? So there was many benefits from using astronomy. Farming come as a practical need for a calendar. As civilizations developed, deeper meanings were attached to astronomical phenomena. 
an overall trend, the more subtle the culture became, the more religious meanings became attached to the sky. Um, and we're talking about the roots there that, you know, already in the Stone and Bronze Ages, we see this mo mo monuments dating back to 3000 BC showing alignments with astronom astronomical significance. That's what a long time ago. This thought that this um, CS, celestial sphere, was unmovable and it was unchanging. Okay. And when we see things here, like the, the eclipse and, you know, when the moon becomes darkened, sorry, it becomes red in colour, they kind of freaked people out and they were served as omens. So good and bad luck. The Babylonians then come along and made the zodiac. And then the Greeks described these moving stars as wandering stars, which is what the word planet comes from. It means wandering star. We can see in Egyptian culture, the, the pyramids lining up to, um, for this one, shafts from the king's chambers indicate location of Polaris, the North Star, 5,000 years ago. I did read once, I don't know how true this was, there was even knowledge of flight, but they certainly had an interest in, in the, the heavens, the Egyptians cultured, culture. I sp spoke about Eudoxus before, how they kind of explain the universe with these nested spheres. Um, but interestingly, they said that the earth was imperfect, but the heavens were perfect. Because the earth had all these mountains on and stuff like that, and it was changeable. Um, and so this is some of the things that Eudoxus and Aristotle spoke about. And that's Eudoxus me method. Uh, how it explains the retrograde motion. What's very interesting, this was an incredibly complex geometrical problem, and he did a very, very good attempt to explain what was going on in this, this shape here. Again, just say an illustration of um, how the Egyptians would line up their sort of uh, windows, if you like, to certain uh, constellations. And I said, look, at certain points of this beautiful ellipse here, you've got the solar and the lunar ellipse there. This is absolutely beautiful. We are the only planet in the known universe that has one of its satellites or its moons that gives a full solar eclipse. And understanding these events, and then we have the lunar eclipse when it's called red. And this was kind of omens, what, if it, was it a bad thing? Was it a good thing? Because they, what the stars told us everything. But today we understand this in a lot more details. We haven't really got time to again look at the videos today, but this video is about Eros Dossinis, how he basically discovered um, how he basically discovered the, the circumference of the earth, which is in a bit more detail than I talked about before. I think I do mention him again now, yes. So the big players in 500 BCE, this classical astronomy to 1480, was Pythagoras, Aristotle, and Eros Dossinis, pioneering in determining the size and the shape of the Earth, and so on. So Pythagoras, his ideas would influence generations of science and philosophers for centuries. They were almost viewed as gods, some of the uh, mathematicians and astronomers. The solid body we call the sphere is perfect, what is meant by this. Naturally, the gods would model the earth as a sphere during the creation. True, but to some extent we've got this um, equatorial bulge and some scale deviations from like mountains and canyons and stuff like this. It's not perfect. Just to reiterate about Eros Dossinis, um, this kind of talks about... Um, a little bit more detail about his actual precision. So this measurement that they used at the time, 500 miles, 5,000 stadia, there was a bit of controversy what that, what that distance represented. So there it is, his diagram of how he explains things. But look at this. He got approximately 25,000, but the, the exact value today, the 24,044 is, is quite, astonishing 
that he actually got this. And it says that some estimate it's off by 16%, depending on the size of the stadium. This is, okay, just going back to this diagram now, this retrograde motion. How did classical astronomers explain this strange moving backwards? How does it explain it? And here's Mars going across the sky. Absolutely fantastic. But what a puzzle. What a problem. What's happening? Well, they did try to explain it. We've got Ptolemy here talking about these epic circles going on. Look at that for a shape. Um, some kind of geometrical reasoning here could explain this. Quite complex hypotheses here from Tom Ptolemy. As it said there, his theories remained in use for another 1500 years until it became too complex to be physically meaningful. Okay, again, the movement of, so it was still quite complex to explain the retrograde motion. So I'm just going to play this video and if John tells me this, you can hear this,
Okay, so very, very interesting. So there was a combination of astronomers there that actually kind of sorted this out, but it was only explained, uh, this optical illusion was explained when we, we uh, said that the, the sun is actually the center of our solar system. And then you can see this overlapping or it's like a race and one of them is going on the inside and then the other one catches up and you get this pattern going on. Um, quite brilliant though, quite fantastic. So interesting, evidence for helocentric model existed, but was just outside our grasp to observe. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. I love that quote. So we're just gonna talk about the re Renaissance now. Uh, Copernicus, Tycho Brahe, Kepler, Galileo and Newton. So here we go, this uh, Polish doctor, um, now able to explain retrograde motion of the planets but there were still some discrepancies. I don't believe Ptolemy's theory, he doesn't have a clue mate. I believe that the sun is at the center of the universe. Earth is just one of five planets that orbit it. So again, uh, it's, it's understood. Now they started to look at this kind of model, which was more in line with what we now believe. Uh, the universe according to Copernicus, this is actual work. And now we've got the, the, the model there. This is the explanation of the retrograde motion, as we explain. Um, Tycho Brahe, again, he's got a fantastic story to tell. Uh, actually built at least four each of, sorry, the most accurate point in a measuring instruments of his time. As I said to you is he's got really good at, um, observational uh, geometry and um, he came an established astronomer. Kepler. We talked about Kepler before um, with his laws. Kepler knows the sun was not at the center of the circulated orbit, but off to the side at a focus of the ellipse. So when you do the ellipse, you have these two foci and everything would center. They would actually help to explain the actual orbit of the planet. Again, you see them there. You have the major and minor axis, these foci here. And this would be the orbit of the planet. Three laws. Planets move in elliptical orbits with the sun at one focus of the ellipse. Planets do not move with constant speed. They move faster when nearer the sun and slow when they farther away. The amount of time it takes for a planet to orbit the sun exactly once is related to the size of the orbit. So that was explained by Kepler's laws and here's them in a, in a nutshell. Quite complex really. So the mathematics, you will do uh, some of the, the, the branch of mathematics called the conics and the ellipses. If you get a cone and you cut it in different ways, you get the, what you call the different conics. You get hyperbola, you have a circle, you have an ellipse. Uh, and, uh, you know, it depends which way you cut it. So you'll study them in, in mathematics. Demonstration of Kepler's third law. Kepler's laws are empirical, which means they are based on actual data and measurements, not just theory. So that's pretty incredible. Kepler's model, uh, of, I was looking for that supernova before and of the solar system. And here is when they actually found it, the supernova that he was referring to. Galileo, Italian scientist, um, of the four moons of Jupiter, evidence of Saturn's rings and, and so on, observed phase of Venus as proof of the heliocentric model, so which was very clever. Uh, he saw the sunspots and explained the sunspots and the cycle of the sun, he explained the phases of Venus as observed from the Earth. Uh, no matter what configuration, epicycles that was put before cannot explain the phases of uh, Venus with a geocentric um, model. So there we go. He was condemned though for his finding. He was actually condemned and he was questioned by the church. I built a telescope, pretty pleased with myself. Copernicus is right, the planets do orbit the sun. Copernicus was worried about the church's views, so didn't publish his ideas until just before his death. I'm going to go for it. Your theories are blasphemy. You should be placed under house arrest. I cannot forget what I've seen. I will continue to study the universe. So this dialogue, this, this argument with the, with the church, because 
it didn't support what the church believed at that time. Galileo continued studying our sun and the universe and played the ultimate prize for science. Newton, born same year as Galileo died, attempts to understand the motion of the planets. And we look at all these great astronomers now, Kepler, Newton and Galileo on our coinage, on our pound notes, on our um, currencies. One of the most famous examples of the clash between religious and science, going back to Galileo, um, he really felt that he, he was right. So what actually happened, he found evidence to include that the sun is at the center of the solar system and the earth orbits the sun. In October 1632, Galileo was ordered to appear before the Pope in Rome. Galileo, they placed him under house arrest. He was found guilty of speaking against the teachers of the church. So he recanted. He basically took it back. So when he wrote his book, the church allowed him to write it, but they said he wasn't the geocentric and the heliocentric model. He was allowed to talk about them, but he wasn't allowed to take one side over the other, but he did. Isaac Newton's laws, there's the first, second and third. You'll study these are mechanics in mathematics and in physics. Um, incredible, absolutely incredible laws and not really intuitive because body will rest up, remain at rest unless a force acts upon it. That wasn't intuitive because everywhere on the earth we see friction. So these are Newton's laws that contributed to the, the story of astronomy. A beautiful story, if you read his life story, by the way, he, he was incredible. Um, man, and I, 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 I encourage you to read his life story because it's fascinating. Edwin Hubble, Hubble 1899-1993, one of the most important figures in modern cosmology is Edwin Hubble. He discovered a, a universe of galaxies outside the Milky Way and showed that the entire verse, universe is actually expanding. In the early 20th century, most astronomers believed that the universe did not extend beyond our Milky Way. So this was controversial, but he was proved correct. Hubble's also discovered that the distance galaxies are moving away from each other, and the greater the distance between them, the two galaxies, the faster they are moving away. This is Hubble's law. Hubble's law shows that the universe indeed is expanding. Okay, uh, George Lamantre was a Belgian cosmologist and Catholic priest. He studied here in Cambridge. He used Hubble's observations regarding the expansion of the universe and came up with the theory of the cosmic egg. So basically, if you could trace things back, you would get to a single point in time. And we call this the Big Bang Theory, which was correct. And there he is there. Caroline um, Herschel and um, William Herschel, brother and sister, um, both really working together, studied and found Uranus and many other objects in, in, in astronomy. So he was um, fantastic, both him and his sister, but not always recognized. Caroline Herschel was not always recognized. But there it says, the catalog of nebula she produced brought her the British Royal Ast Astronomical Society's 1828 gold medal, which is quite unusual for a, a female at that time to be involved in astron astronomy, but she was fantastic. Okay, um, Penzines and Robert Wilson both discovered what we now know as the cosmic microwave background. When they were working on uh, their instrument, they thought they were getting interference, but they realized it's coming from the sky and they realized that it's evidence. They actually found evidence of the Big Bang uh, theory. And this was them there in Cambridge and I'll just show you the diagram there that kind of shows what they were really finding. Okay, the cosmic microwave background, which was remnants of the Big Bang um, theory. Um, Multi-wavelength is basically when we look at the universe. I'm just going to forward a few slides on for time. I'm aware that we're running low on time. So I'm just going to fast forward to a slide which talks about multi-wavelength universe. So why would we do this? So this is, um, so Markins that talk about an event that happened in um, 
1054, the supernova, and this was the remnants of it, the Crab Nebula. If we looked at in visible light, we would see this. If we looked at in radio telescope, we would see different things. Um, infrared, we would see the heated dust. But you can actually see here something pulsing in the middle. Um, UV light, again, different aspects of the Crab Nebula. X-rays, you could actually see everything disappear apart from this pulsar in the middle when they discovered pulsar. Jocelyn Bell Bennell discovered this X-ray. I'm just going to conclude with this picture here. Voyager 1, which was completed its primary mission, this is in 1990, leaving the solar system, was commanded by NASA to turn its camera around and take one last photograph of Earth across a great expanse of space at the request of the astronomer and author, Carl Sagan. So there it was completing its mission. It turned around. What did it see? This sunbeam, the little dot. So why do we study astronomy? I'm just going to read this for you. It'll take about two minutes. This is Carl Sagan's words. He said, look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of, every human being, whoever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering. Thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species live there on a malt of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph, they become the momentary master of a fraction of a dot. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe, our challenge by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from somewhere else to save us from ourselves. The earth is the only world we know so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could immigrate. Visit, yes. Settle not. Like it or not, for the moment, the earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits that this distant image of our tiny world, to me, it underscores, underscores our re responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. So I'd like to thank you for listening. There was more, but time is um, coming come against us too. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Thank you for that uh, profound uh, sort of finish there to, uh, to, to, to an amazing presentation. And, uh, and thank you for, for giving us a whistle stop tour of the history of astronomy. <laughs> really appreciate it. I know it's a lot to fit in. Um, if anyone does have any questions, please post them now. Um, if not, um, obviously, when we send you a copy of the presentation and the video, you can ask your questions, obviously, via email, and we'll, we'll put them to Darren and the team 
but hopefully um, that's been a really useful insight into into certainly some of the work we do in physics and maths and how it's related to to, to topics such as astronomy, but also the kind of passion that our teachers have for extracurricular activities as well. Like I said before, we have an astronomy club and teachers like Darren and other teachers do do run that with the students. So you could imagine if this is your passion, you really, really have an amazing opportunity to explore it further within college and around your studies. Um, I can't see any other questions coming through. So I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll thank Darren very much. Darren, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. Um, and uh, we'll just say goodbye to everyone. Thank you very much for attending. Have a lovely afternoon or evening, wherever you are. Bye bye.